Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the October 27th, 2021 Hospital Partners Innovation Webinar. I'm your guest host, Dr. Edward Bacho, and I'll be filling in for the amazing Dr. Chad Versio. Today's speaker is one of the most charismatic and innovative physicians I know. Dr. Steve Sorrell currently serves as Division Chief of the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Riverside University Health System. Through his guiding principle of applying the Mamba mentality to tackle GI disparities in our community, he is leading the ongoing expansion of gastroenterology services at RUHS. The RUHS Department of Gastroenterology now has the capability to provide our patients with advanced luminal endoscopy options using wireless capsule endoscopy, or WCE. Through this presentation, Dr. Sorrell will provide an overview of WCE and explore the indications and pathologic findings using this diagnostic technology, all while shedding the spotlight on other new technological breakthroughs in capsule endoscopy. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Steve Sorrell. Dr. Sorrell. Thank you, Dr. Bacho, for that kind introduction. Uh, we're excited to be here. Uh, as always, I think we're adding more service opportunities and programs onto our, onto our service line. And uh, we just wanted to come out and share a little bit of what we're doing uh, and see how we can all work together to provide this level of service to our patients. Um, so, my, so my presentation today uh, will we'll go through a case study uh, overview of a wireless capsule endoscopy. Uh, what does it take to prepare a patient for this procedure? Common endoscopic findings, uh, some contraindications and considerations um, before we uh, do this procedure. And of course, what impact is that gonna have on our, on our um, healthcare system and our patients? So I'd like to start off with a uh, case study that we come across uh, quite often in GI. Uh, this is a 64-year-old with a coronary artery disease, uh, has mild aortic stenosis, has been on Plavix for one month, uh, and noted to have developed anemia. This is actually a case straight out of my fellowship training. Um, hemoglobin at baseline was 11 uh, and dropped down to 7 grams per deciliter. MCV about 88. Uh, and there's no evidence of an overt GI bleed. The primary doctor said, you know, the patient was pretty adamant. They didn't notice any blood in the stool. And of importance, of course, there's no GI surgeries that might have caused this uh, over a chronic, over a long period of time. Uh, so we did the workup. You know, the acute onset anemia uh, deserves a workup. Uh, so we did a hematological workup, iron studies, vitamin B12, folate, particular site count, all of which came within within normal uh, limits. Uh, we did an upper and lower endoscopy, so that's our next step is to see if there's any uh, obvious evidence of bleeding. Um, so we did an upper endoscopy. EGD showed some mild gastropathy. Sure, there was um, some damage, and but the colon showed no polyps. Uh, you know, we would you know or or a large diverticular that might have bled. Um, nothing to point towards an acute bleed. Uh, we did take biopsies in the in the stomach, and and of course the biopsies came back as chronic inactive gastritis. Here we're thinking about could this be H. pylori, but then it's all of a sudden it's about three units worth of blood, three grams uh, worth of blood. Um, so we have to kind of think about you know what might have caused this. Uh, no evidence of H. pylori and marsh lesion was zero. We checked for celiac disease. Um, so so got. So we started thinking about this and said, okay, so the clinical picture clearly does not fit the findings. Uh, gastropathy shouldn't and shouldn't uh, end up with a with a, with such a significant drop in hemoglobin, even though the patient's on Plavix. Um, so we haven't looked at the small bowel, and that's where the that's where the thought process starts. So we did end up doing a wireless capsule endoscopy for this patient, the result of which we'll present later at after the presentation. So a wireless capsule endoscopy is not a new technology. It's been around since 1990s. It has, though, uh, gone through a significant evolution. So we look at the number of companies that provide this service to us. Medtronic is, is, what, is what I call this, you know, the, the leader in this space, uh, along with Olympus and, and Capsule Vision. There's a lot of new, new companies that are coming on with newer um, technologies, but these are the 
three key players in the market right now. Um, and so why do we use capsule endoscopy? And traditionally, capsule endoscopy was used uh, to look at the small bowel. And so we said, okay, well, we developed that space and we looked at a capsule endoscopy in a small bowel. And now recently we have moved uh, into capsule endoscopy for the colon. And that just opens up the, um, the extent of use and the opportunities for use. And, and also for the upper GI tract. And I'll go, I kind of tease out the nuances uh, during this presentation. But it's really, really interesting um, the number of images it takes uh, per second. So, um, and I'll show you the size in just a minute, but the amount of images per second is about two to six for a, um, a small bowel capsule and between 18 and 35 images per second. Um, and that is a fast rate of uh, image capture. We have all the way from 360 view. So uh, a camera is able to, to look at 360 around itself uh, to a 156 degree view, which we use for, uh, for small bowel capsule. The, the life of the camera as, it's, as it makes its way down the GI tract lasts from eight hours to 15 hours. Um, with quite a good resolution. At the highest resolution right now is with Medtronic with 320 by 320, which is uh, fairly good uh, when it comes to visualizing um, pathology. So it looks, it's not as big as this, but you know, it says how I communicate to my patients is, you know, they try to try to see, okay, what does it uh, closely resemble? And it's slightly larger than, than a Tylenol uh, uh, a pill, so or or a penny, and we find a lot of pennies in stomachs nowadays. So, uh, if this goes down, this is, can definitely go down. Um, there are some patients that have dysphagia, and we'll talk a little bit about contraindications later. But that's approximate size of the pill cam. Uh, this is a uh, just images of the pill cam from the different companies. Here you have uh, the pill cam from uh, Medtronic, Olympus, Miracam, and, and uh, Osmond. And um, this gets into, into a lot of detail. I don't expect anyone to memorize all this, but you can see the amount of technology that goes into producing a pill of this, of this sort. And uh, the price per capsule is really about 250 to 500 um, per pill. So what's in a wireless capsule? Um, and, and we get a lot of patients who ask, oh, so what am I really swallowing? And so, um, so the capsule is a really compact camera is what I try to explain, you know, is, is what I try to tell them. So it is an optical dome, uh, which, which allows the camera to, um, to take the pictures. We have white LEDs uh, that allow for lighting as the camera is making its way or the capsule is making its way down the, down the, um, um, down the, the lumen. Um, we have a CMOS imager that's built into it, which I think is fascinating considering the size of this, um, uh, this capsule. We have two watch batteries and an antenna. Uh, so it's nice and compact. Um, very easy to swallow. Uh, I have to say that I, I did one myself in one of the fellowship training courses. And, um, uh, you know, with, uh, with about eight, eight ounces of water, it's really easy to swallow. Uh, but this is, this is a, the technology that's actually packed into the small capsule, a little larger than a Tylenol pill. Um, so, so what is our RUHS protocol for patients that uh, we decide should or would benefit from a, a capsule endoscopy. And it really starts on day five. Um, we are planning for, at this point, we're doing between one and two patients a day, um, Monday to Thursday, which includes inpatients. So five days prior to the procedure, and this is specifically for the outpatient uh, population. We want to stop taking uh, pills or iron supplements or multivitamins, which might uh, cause coloration or discoloration of the bowel. So we stop taking iron supplements. Continue all the other medications. There's no need uh, for patients to hold back um, of their other medications. Now, three days before, we want to start moving to a low roughage diet. Um, and, and so they may eat um, the few foods that are listed here. And there's a whole list of foods that I'm not going to read here because it's going to take most of our lunch break uh, to, uh, to avoid. 
Um, if they have a history of constipation, this is where we really work with them to make sure that they, they're not constipated before taking the, the prep. So one day before surgery, they go on a clear liquid diet. You wanna avoid red and purple because those colors just do not do well with gastroenterologists. We get all nervous when we see the color red or purple in there. Uh, we don't know if it's an active bleed. And then we start the laxative uh, prep as instructed by the, by the physicians. The day of the procedure, uh, you continue with no eating or drinking just so that uh, we can have a successful high quality capsule and endoscopy. Um, and then uh, once you swallow the capsule, two hours after swallowing the capsule, we ask our patients to drop by to the GI lab so we can monitor the progress of the capsule and make sure that it's where it's supposed to be. Uh, if you've swallowed it through the, through the esophagus, uh, it's probably going to be somewhere in the small bowel, and we want to just verify that. Um, four hours after swallowing the capsule, they may have clear liquids. I try to tell my patients just to hold off and try to avoid any, um, any foods for the duration of the procedure, because that's where you can get a really high quality um, uh, uh, you know, uh, procedure. So, I, so you want to really return the equipment after eight hours. So that's what we really tell them. Hey, after eight hours, you really need to be here so we can take the receiver uh, and then download the, the information on the receiver. Now, this is what it looks like. It might remind you of, uh, of what we place, you know, leads that we place uh, on the chest to do, in, to do, to do an EKG. Um, and so these are leads that go on the abdomen uh, and these leads are wireless um, receiver. So, so the information that is transmitted by the capsule through the antenna are picked up by these, uh, by these leads and stored in a receiver. Uh, and, and, and this is a storage device that stores um, the equipment, uh, the, the uh, information rather. Uh, the patient wears it around a harness um, on the side. So it's a belt that comes with, um, with the equipment and we have the patient wear it during the duration of the study. This is the pill cam. It comes in a small little encased um, um, uh, case here. Uh, here you can see the nurse uh, tagging the pill cam to the patient's uh, receiver. And this is a really vital piece of, um, of step we call syncing. We wanna make sure that the pill cam uh, matches the MR number of the patient and it's synced together so the information collected can then uh, make its way into EPIC and we, and we know who whose pill cam we are actually, we are actually reading. Uh, and then the placement here, and you can see the screen here, you can already see the lumen uh, in view and the, and the nurse here is verifying that the pill cam is actually taking images and making its way uh, down the lumen. There are some pill cams that might not uh, um, take images and might fail on us. So this step is extremely important to make sure that the pill cam is actually functioning. Okay, so um, we're looking at indications for an upper GI. So, you know, here's the question. So the question becomes, um, who would benefit from uh, a wireless capsule endoscopy? And I'd like to take this in, you know, by doing three, uh, you know, look at it from three perspectives. So the first one is the upper GI uh, capsule. So who would benefit from an upper GI capsule? So this is a new, um, upper GI capsule uh, from, from, from Medtronic. Uh, we have the capability of ordering it for our patients. The, the process is the same. The prep process is the same for these patients. Of course, they will not go through the whole colon prep. Uh, but typically, these are reserved for patients that either refuse or are, or are unable to go through an upper endoscopy. They're, they're sick enough, they cannot go through an upper endoscopy. And we really feel the need that they would benefit from imaging of the esophagus and the stomach. The difference to this pill is that it's got two lenses in here. So it's taking pictures bi-directionally as it's going down the esophagus. And the rate of image capture is higher because from the oropharynx to the GI tract, it's a short distance. It, you want to make sure that it's capturing at a higher rate. So um, we're able to capture you know, Barrett's esophagus, reflux esophagitis, uh, esophageal varices. Um, and here are some of the, this is what the image looks like. So of course, when you read this, 
Uh, this is going at a high rate of speed. You, we always want to slow it down. At least my brain wants to slow it down. So this is a normal esophagus uh, on the left side. This is someone that has suspected Barrett's. Now remember, this is a diagnostic tool, so we haven't taken biopsies to prove that this is in fact Barrett's. Um, this is someone that has very bad esophagitis, so you can see the red inflamed uh, esophagus. And these are varices. You know, this, this is probably a cirrhotic patient that uh, had the capsule endoscopy and, and has varices. Now, being a diagnostic tool, it just does that. So we, we just know that the patient has varices. The next question, then comes up clinically, is this bad enough that we have to go in and band it? Or is there medication that we can provide for it? And then of course we'll have to biopsy this to see if there's dysplasia. So that's always the next, um, the next finding. Other findings in the stomach, for example, this is the stomach. We can see uh, this just from, the, from the, uh, the mucosa. This is called portal hypertensive gastropathy. This is a image captured using a, um, a wireless capsule in, uh, endoscopy technique. This is an ulcer that was captured near the antrum. Um, and you can see the, the, um, uh, the, the, it looks like it had bled in the past. And uh, these are things that we always are concerned about. So this looks like a nice ball uh, shaped um, protrusion in the field of view. And this is actually a gist or a gastrointestinal stromal tumor um, that, uh, should be looked at endoscopically after this procedure. But catching these um, stromal tumors are quite common during a small bowel um, endoscopy. So moving on to small bowel, uh, this is your small bowel camera and you can see the difference already. It has one uh, um, uh, lens and camera uh, versus the two, uh, which is for the upper GI. But this is a great way of looking for overt and covert um, or occult rather small bowel bleeding. And this is a really, really nice way. This is, this is what we adopted this technology for uh, predominantly. It can also be used for, uh, to check for intestinal tumors. Like for example, the gist that we saw in the last image can actually be seen on small bowel. Uh, so we can find these gists in small bowel. Um, really nice, uh, use of this technology, I think in the next few years is, to go to, is, is going to be for Crohn's disease. And I have a slide uh, on that. Um, uh, and then of course, for patients that have polyposis syndrome. So some of the patients, um, we do this to look for polyposis in the small bowel, um, a large number of polyps. Um, so, so, so really a nice uh, diverse uh, utilization of the small bowel capsule. Again, you can see the, the images here and I can walk you through it. So this red spot right here is, is, is what we call an angiodysplasia. Uh, there's one right here, an image E2. So these can bleed, uh, you know, um, usually seen in cardiac patients that have mechanical valves. Uh, there's a syndrome called Hades syndrome that um, you can have mechanical valves that cause angiodysplasia due to von Willebrand factor deficiency or cleavage of the of the protein, um, and so um, so so these can be treated, and these tend to bleed when the patient's on uh, on Plavix or an, on anticoagulation. This again is a submucosal tumor, as you can see here, quite similar to the one the gist that we saw in prior images. We can see submucosal tumors here. This one's ulcerated; there's an ulcer on it. So definitely concerning needs to be biopsied. Uh, these are erosions. Um, uh, and and then an, a clean based also here, and and of course some 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 benign findings uh, like like uh, um, red spots here and here, which can cause bleeding if the patient's um, uh, anticoagulated. Uh, let's see here, perfect. Um, so we talk about Crohn's disease. You know, it, you know we do an EGD coronoscopy. We do biopsies, but we rarely look at the small bowel. This uh, prior, we used to use CT enterography or MR enterography to get a clear view of the, um, of, of the small bowel structure, but the video capsule endoscopy has really transformed the, our capability to look inside the lumen without being there. So this, these are examples uh, of patients with uh, edema of the small bowel. You can see that the, the folds are very edematous here. 
you see small erosion. These are called aphthous erosions uh, or aphthoid erosions, superficial ulcerations here, very deep ulcerations, and a stenosis. This is where the pill cam will probably be uh, held back. And so these are all um, these are all sequelae of Crohn's disease that we can see using using capsule endoscopy. So the new kid on the block that uh, hasn't gained much traction yet, but I believe will have some opportunity in the future, um, is your colon uh, capsule endoscopy. Um, so the CC2 again has two uh, two images, and this is this is really I think the space for this is going to be for patients that um, you know we should continue to do screening on, uh, but are too sick to get moderate sedation. Uh, but still request uh, colon cancer screening. So that's the space that I could see this being used. Also, you know, to look for bleeding in the small bowel, uh, sorry, in the colon rather, uh, that's, that's, that's another space that this could be used. So um, I just think that, uh, you know, anytime you see a polyp, you know, the next step is to kind of take it out and it's really easy in a colonoscopy. But there's some instances such as the ones that I've explained where I think this, this could be, uh, interesting in the future. So here's some examples. Again, as you can see, there's an angiodysplasia uh, that that we have that we have noted here. It happens in this in the colon as well as the small bowel. Uh, a little bit easier to reach in the colon, of course. Uh, and of course, here you can see a polyp. Um, you know, there's a bunch of polyps here. These are uh, ticks or diverticula um, that, that that we know of. And of course, we have some erosions here in the cecum. And this is an interesting one. They actually uh, saw a roundworm uh, in the cecum. So, you, so you know, it's a, you know, it's it's very rare, but you, you can sometimes see um, uh, roundworm or even tapeworm in in the colons. Uh, so let's talk about some contraindications because this is this is what keeps us awake at night. So uh, contraindications for this is suspected small bowel. Um, obstruction or strictures or, or fistulas um, known or, or suspected. And, and, and so there's different ways that we kind of test for this and look for this before we drop the, the, um, uh, the wireless capsule. Of course, the first question to patients is, you know, have you had surgery in the past uh, that, that, that involves the, the gut? And, and, and usually if that doesn't work, just open up the abdomen and see if they have a scar and that should give you some some indication of uh, what their surgical record is. Um, uh, cardiac or implanted electrical devices, including gastric paces, you always have to do a second take at this. Not to the, not to say that that it's a it's an absolute contraindication, but some devices can actually cause um, interference uh, with the with the capsule endoscopy, and your videos may not be completely um, uh, clear. There may be some uh, electrical or wireless. Uh, uh, interference with that. So that's something to kind of watch out for. So, so how do we get past this? So one of the ways to get past this is to use what we call a, um, a, a, a patency capsule. So this is an image of a patency capsule. Uh, this is what it looks like. And this is the, um, uh, it's, it's kind of broken down here, but you have an RFID chip in the, in the, in the, in the middle, which uh, will pass right and 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 it's got a dissolvable body so it, it actually gets absorbed in the body if it gets stuck somewhere so 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 this is the patency capsule and usually we can drop a patency capsule to see if 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 uh if the actual wireless capsule endoscopy will actually pass so we have this nice little neat technique that uh, that that we can use the other one we can do is um is a is a, a CT enterography. You can, you can do a CT enterography prior to the procedure to see if there's any strictures of concern. Uh, the Pillcam um, patency capsule works really well. There are some instances such as this one I've uh, I've uh, shown here. Uh, this capsule actually uh, the patency capsule actually went through. The actual capsule got retained. So, so there are some instances, it's not foolproof, of course, uh, there are some instances where it just does not work and, and the stricture is significant enough that it will uh, hold up the, uh, the actual capsule. So what do we do if a capsule gets, uh, gets retained? Well, uh, that's when we bring out the fun tools, right? It's not always fun, but uh, some of them are. Um, 
Uh, we're actually doing a case today that we have retained capsule in the IC valve. So we're doing colonoscopy and we'll use a device such as this. It's, uh, it's a basket to go in and capture the, uh, 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 the capsule and take it out. Some of the capsules can be stuck in, in diverticula, so you've got to be uh, uh, careful and gentle as you do that. And sometimes they're far enough that uh, we cannot be reached uh, even, even uh, you know, uh, and surgically uh, we need to go. And here's a small bowel that has been opened up and you can see this black uh, capsule has been sitting there for a very long time. This is a stricture uh, in the small bowel that couldn't be reached um, endoscopically, even with uh, double balloon entero uh, enteroscopy. Um, we'd like Dr. to Sarah. avoid, yes. Uh, we have about two and a half minutes left. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so we have MRI that we want to try to avoid uh, for this patient for about a week. And uh, safety data for pregnancy is limited to very single uh, case reports. Um, just, 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 you know, for those that have questions about if this is going to be identified by TSA, it's not. Um, but clearly this, this guy is, is, is ready with a glove if needed. I have to drop a GI joke in there. So back to our patient. Um, this patient actually had melanoma uh, and uh, the Plavix actually uh, increased the bleeding risk for the melanoma. We noted the bleed on capsule endoscopy. So what is the impact? And uh, I have one more slide to go and, and I'll be done. So, you know, we're really building critical uh, in-house capacity. For, uh, you know, this is going to reduce our patient referral times. For small bowel capsule, our referral times range from three to six months. It's down to one week now. So we're definitely improving access for our patients. Once we make the diagnosis, we can send them for double balloon or single balloon enteroscopy. So what comes next is single balloon enteroscopy, uh, which is right here, which is where we can go in and actually treat what we find and double balloon enteroscopy, which is a very deeper scope. Uh, we can actually get uh, straight down to, the, uh, down to the IC valve with this um, if, you're, if you're really, really good. Um, Okay, and that's it. Time for discussion. Thank you, Dr. Sorrell. Uh, this is an amazing option to have. That talk with the patients to undergo traditional endoscopy can definitely be a tough pill to swallow. Forgive me, please. But I can certainly see how this makes it way more accessible for our uh, patients. So in our last minute, um, you know, I just wanted to ask you, as a primary care provider, how do I get a patient over for WCE? Yeah, so... Um... So this is definitely part of uh, workups uh, for anemia, IBD, um, uh, you know, a, a GI bleed that we are not really familiar, uh, you know, where where it's actually occurring from. So so uh, so usually we would refer it over to us in GI. Uh, we'd start the workup with, you know, as we did for the prior patients with some lab work. We'll do the EGD colonoscopy, and then we'll make the decision to to do uh, a capsule endoscopy. So if you come across patients in your panel that have had an EGD colonoscopy and you're still struggling with anemia, uh, these would be good patients to refer to us for capsule endoscopy. You do not need to put in the order. We will 